Good afternoon. Good afternoon and welcome to the City Club of Portland. My name is Patty Bedient, Club President, and I'd like to start this afternoon's program with an introduction of a couple of new members seated at the table here. I'd like to ask them to stand as I call their name. We'll start with Andrea Hungerford, Legal Assistant, Conflict Management Institute, and Gerald McFadden, President and CEO, Volunteers of America of Oregon. Please welcome them to the City Club. Some announcements on upcoming programs. First of all, next Friday, August 21st, we'll be with Charles Jordan, Director, Parks and Recreation for the City of Portland, speaking on Parks and Recreation, More Than Fun and Games. Jordan will discuss a new way of thinking about the role of parks and recreation in the struggle to help troubled and at-risk youth. That program will be here in the Benson Hotel. The following Friday, August 28th, Governor Barbara Roberts will be with us. In the wake of the legislative session on her tax plan, the governor will talk about where Oregon should go from here. Please note that there is a pre-registration form in the bulletin, and in order to ensure your reservation, please fill it out and send it in with your check to the club office. That program will be held in the state ballroom at the Hilton Hotel. The key to the success of the City Club is its members, and I'd like to take a moment to thank you, to say thank you to the following members who participated recently in a telephone calling project encouraging those who had not yet responded to their June renewal statements to renew their memberships. So thanks go to Donna Acord, Randy Arthur, Pete Bayer, Alan Hunt, Teresa Lukowski Clark, Doug McCourt, Mona Okazaki, Ethelyn Pankratz, and Chuck Williams. Their help is very much appreciated, and for those of you who haven't sent in your statements yet, please do so. There's a lot ahead uh, with the club this year. Our board host for today's program, seated at the head table to my far right, is Mary McWilliams, president-elect of the City Club and CEO of the Sisters of Providence Health Systems. She has the privilege of asking the first question. The second question, following our speaker's remarks, will be asked by Sandy Marin of the Human Services Standing Committee. Following those questions, we'll open up the meeting to questions from City Club members in the audience. If you'd rather have a written question, there are forms on the table in front of you. Please fill out those forms and hold them up after the speaker's remarks and staff will gather them. Well, growing up, we were all taught that an apple a day keeps the doctor away, or an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Well, in many ways, this country seems to have an illness system, not a health care system. While Oregon has been a leader in health care reform, the state's major reform plan is now on hold. Dr. Carol Lindemann, Dean of the School of Nursing at Oregon Health Sciences University, is with us today to discuss why our current system is ineffective. She will describe the fundamental changes as well as the leadership needed to create a community-based holistic primary health care system, a system which focuses on prevention and treats the whole person, not isolated symptoms. Dr. Lindemann received her diploma in nursing from the Evangelical Deaconess Hospital School of Nursing in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and her PhD in educational psychology from the University of Wisconsin at Madison. She holds several honorary doctoral degrees and has received numerous awards for her distinguished service in the nursing profession. She is a past board member of the American Nurses Association and the American Association of Colleges of Nursing. She is currently president-elect of the National League of Nursing and is national nursing consultant to the Veterans Administration. In addition, she serves on the advisory boards of numerous nursing journals and as program reviewer to several nursing education centers across the United States certainly well qualified to speak to the City Club on health care. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Carol Lindemann. Thank you for the opportunity to address you on the topic of health care and health care issues. A fellow airplane passenger helped me recently develop a deeper understanding of how desperate Americans feel about the current health care system. I was flying back to Portland, having given a speech in Leisure World in Laguna Beach 
on health care reform and engaging in casual conversation with the man and the woman seated next to me. They asked why I had been in Laguna Beach, and I said I was there to speak about health care, at which point the man's face took on a very angry appearance, and he said he had the solution for the health care crisis, and that was that anybody who became ill who, and did not have insurance should be dragged out of the city and shot. Now I looked at him and expected him to tell me that he was joking. He wasn't. And he got so irate as he continued to think about the issue and to talk about the issue that his wife had to take pains to try to calm him down at which point she said to me, you must understand, he has a plumbing business in San Francisco and he has to decide whether to go bankrupt or continue to pay health care insurance for his employees. Now I have found out that that situation is neither unique nor atypical in characterizing the feelings of the public about health care and the health care system here in the United States. Almost everybody agrees that there is a crisis or a catastrophe in terms of health care. And you cannot go one day without being bombarded with about data about health care and the millions of Americans who do not have access to health care. On a daily basis now we hear about the rising costs of health health care to employers, to the state and federal government, and to the individual. We hear, as we did just this week, about uh, Caterpillar employees lose, retired from that company losing their health care benefits. And although we know that every politician has a health care plan guaranteed to cure the system of all it, its ailments, Americans feel increasing panic about what might happen to them in terms of access and the costs for health care. There is increasing skepticism rather than decreasing skepticism that Washington, D.C. will do anything to take care of health care for those of us who need it. What Americans want, which is no different from what citizens of any country want, is simply access to quality health care at an affordable cost. It seems fairly simple when you state it that way. However, when you raise the question which comes next, why don't we have that in the United States, we find that opinions differ greatly. Our failure to agree on the problem actually is the greatest uh, cause for our being unable to make progress in finding solutions to the problems that face us. From recent surveys, it is clear that there are deep divisions between the way experts view health care, and by experts I mean third-party payers, pharmaceutical firms, organized medicine, and the organized hospital association. There are great differences between how those experts view health care and the way the public views health care. According to focus group discussions held across the United States by the Public Agenda Foundation, for the public, the main forces driving up health care costs are human and moral factors that they label as greed, high salaries, corruption, waste, and unnecessary testing. A quote from the forum group is as follows. Although people disagreed about which human factors were most at fault, nearly everyone believed that the real cause of the problem was that someone wanted to make too much money. The consensus was that the healthcare system does not have a cost crisis, it has a profit crisis. Now, to the public, again, as information coming out of these forums, they do not see these problems as new. They believe they have been in the system for as long as the healthcare system has existed. In contrast, 
the experts at these forums tended to see the current crisis as a new problem and caused by factors that the system has never had to deal with before. And they identified two problems, the increasing number of elderly and the high cost of technology. But even on these two issues, there is division between the public and the experts on how to proceed to deal with the issues. The public, for example, seems much more willing to restrict or constrain the use of costly technology than the experts have been in these forum discussions. Now to add to that particular point, I too want to bombard you with a minute for some of the data about the current healthcare system. And I am not here representing any political party, but I do have to say, when the President of the United States said in his State of the Union address that there is nothing wrong with the health care system, I certainly found myself in sharp disagreement. And so I share with you some of the data regarding cost, access, and quality of our current health care system. According to the latest data that we have, about 16 percent of our state and local taxes go for health care. About 14 percent of our country's gross national product goes for health care. In 1992, it is projected that we will spend $817 billion on health care. We in this country will spend two and a quarter billion dollars each day on health care. Those costs are more than any other developed country in the United States, and in fact, the United States spends twice the average on health care costs that come from other industrialized countries. Despite putting that money into health care, what are the other statistics? You all know as well as I do that between 34 and 40 million Americans do not have access to health care. And we also know that there are an increasing number who are underinsured, meaning they have health care coverage, but it doesn't pay enough to get them into the system and to receive benefits from the system. We also know from all of the statistics available to us that despite the dollars going into our current health care system, Americans are not healthier than other people. For example, of the 24 industrialized nations making up the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, the United States ranked 21st out of 24 in terms of infant mortality, 17th out of 24th in male life expectancy, and 16th out of 24th in female life expectancy. In comparing the United States with all of these countries that have universal access and less costs, and looking at an aggregate score in terms of overall quality of health care, the United States was at the bottom of the list. Now again, of critical importance in thinking about that is that in the United States, the largest percentage of our dollars go for illness care and for high technology, and relatively little of our dollars go for primary health care and for basic health care services, which is in direct contradiction from s countries who have better health statistics than we do. But if you don't feel badly enough about our current health care system, I want to share a few more statistics. Those that have been with us for several years coming from the Pepper Commission with the federal government and also from independent researchers who have attempted to study quality of health care here in the United States. And these are their statistics. 25% of patients who die in today's hospitals are dying probably because they have been misdiagnosed. 35% of hospital admissions are not needed. 15 to 30% of diagnostic tests are not needed but worse yet are not even looked at after they are put on the patient's chart. 25% of hospital days could be done without, 25% of hospital procedures could be done without, 40% of medications that are ordered are not needed, and the, 
data go on, 44% of bypass surgeries are unwarranted, 56% of pacemaker implants are questionable. If you're a woman and you still have your uterus, count yourself fortunate. 27% of the hysterectomies in this country not only are questionable, but are absolutely, totally unwarranted as judged by surgeons looking at data and records. Of the 1,300 elderly patients screened by the RAND Corporation think tank who had an operation to uh, remove arthrosclerotic plaque from the carotid artery, one-third of them did not need to have it done. It wasn't in the questionable category. It was outright not needed. And despite decades of using fetal monitors in labor and delivery rooms, we now know that you are better off to have a nurse with a stethoscope, that that equipment, that high technology, those high costs have done nothing to change statistics in terms of the health of the babies or the health of the mothers. There are truly no data to support the use of that kind of equipment for normal, everyday labor and delivery situations. Now, if that doesn't make you feel shocked and bad enough, you need to think about other aspects of our system. According to data co coming out of Consumer's Report uh, this last month, over $80 billion a year is for fraud in our current system, and you've read about it. People build for things that never occur. People brought in for screening and tests that are not needed. Uh, but bills being submitted, $80 billion a year for that, $30, $130 billion for unnecessary procedures, and $163 billion for administering a system that doesn't work. Now that's the picture of healthcare here in the United States. And you may not like what I say, but those are the facts about the system. And when you think about the facts, you may say, well, I feel very good about my health care. Well, great. But you have to remember that for every one of you, there are more people who don't have access, who are suffering from the lack of quality and the other issues. These are the facts about our system. Now, you might say, well, gee, if it's that bad, why hasn't something been done about it? I mean, here in the United States, don't we just go right to the bottom and correct all of these things and make the world better? Well, I'm going to answer that question through the use of an analogy from the business world, and the people that are here representing the automobile industry may not like this analogy, but I offer it to you as one that comes out of a, a book I read recently called Future Edge, written by Joel Arthur Barker. And in that book, he talks about what he calls paradigms and paradigm shifts. And he uses the word paradigm to simply refer to the model or set of rules and regulations that specify how a system works and how you can be successful within it. In one sense, our current healthcare system here in the United States represents a paradigm or model on how to get healthcare to people. And we know from looking at the literature and our travels that other countries have other paradigms. Now, having said that about the nature of a paradigm, I want you to think for a moment about the words that come to your mind when you'd go back to the 1960s and the words that you used to associate with products that were stamped made in Japan. Most of the words that come to mind uh, from that era were thing, are words such as cheap, junk, tin cans, toys, poor, unreliable, etc. But now change your time frame for a minute and put yourself into the 1980s and think of the words that come to your mind as you look at a product stamp made in Japan. The words that tend to come forward are things like best buy, high technology, highly reliable, cost effective, and so on. Now what happened in Japan to bring about that change? How within that time span did they move from products that were thought of one way to products that were thought of in entirely a different way? 
Again, most of you know the answer to that uh, uh, question. They changed what's called their manufacturing paradigm. And it began by a man from the United States named Edwards Deming, who had an idea about a better way to manage manufacturing. And here in the United States, his ideas were not accepted. He went to Japan at the request of General Douglas MacArthur, and they set about recreating business in Japan using his paradigm blended with the work of other Japanese scholars. And what came out of that work is what we know of today in terms of total quality management, the quality circle paradigm, and so on. By the uh, 1970s, the 1980s, high quality products showed up here in the United States from Japan, and they were impressive in terms of their quality and durability. But what did we in the United States say about those companies and their manufacturing? We said, well, their products are only better because all their factories are newer. That's why the cars are better or more dependable. And so the researchers said, well, let's see if that's true. And they made comparisons between the age of our factories and the age of the factories in Japan and said that does not account for the difference. What was the next excuse that came forward here in the United States? We said, well, the workforce in Japan is better. They all speak the same language. Uh, they all uh, come from the same social class and so on. That's why their products are better. Here in the United States, our workforce isn't as good, and that's why our products uh, are different. So what happened? Sony Corporation set up a plant in San Diego, and they started manufacturing some of their TV equipment right there using the American workforce. And what happened when we compared the products from that American workforce using Japanese management techniques with our own, we found that their products were still superior to those coming out of our businesses. And finally, in the United States, we ended up saying, maybe they know something that we ought to attend to, and maybe we ought to go about trying to find out those management techniques that can indeed improve our products in terms of quality, reliability, and and durability. Now, why do I bring that up in a speech about healthcare? I bring that up because it seems to me we are in the same situation in terms of dealing with healthcare issues here in the United States. We want to hold on to a system that, from all the data available, tells us it is not an effective system. And we want to put forward excuse after excuse as to why Japan can have the lowest infant mortality rate and only put 7% it, of its grand, um, national product into health care, and we put 14% in, and we have one of the poorer infant mortality rates. We put forward excuses in terms of why America is always different instead of saying maybe a different paradigm would work for us in terms of health care, just as it has worked in terms of other aspects of our life. So in a sense, part of what I'm trying to say to you today is that band-aids on the current system will not work. The system that we have here in the United States is a system that believes that high-tech will always cure the person or will always work. It is a system that would rather treat the illness than get out and give immunizations to prevent some of the illnesses from becoming uh, what they are. And it is a system that wants to give control of the system to the few rather than to open up control and allow consumers to have greater choice within that system. Now again, I believe that we know from other countries that money is not the answer. We can put billions more in this system, and I will say to you again that we will not get 
better health statistics from that system. We know from other countries that total access is possible. There is absolutely no reason in this country for people not to be able to get health care. We know from other countries that health data, infant mortality, life expectancy, is related to primary health care, not illness care. We know from other countries that health is a personal matter and that you start the development of a healthy country by emphasizing good nutrition, exercise, control of stress, and making those things available to the youngest person in our country. We know from other countries that governments can fund health care costs with reasonable overhead and provide quality care and choice. Now I want to say a few things about where nursing fits into all of this. Obviously I am the Dean of the School of Nursing, as you know, from an introduction. And you might say, you know, why is a nurse talking about this? Why is nursing involved? Nursing, and certainly the American Nurses Association and the National League for Nursing, believe that health care reform will come from groups such as nursing forming partnerships with lay groups in communities and at a grassroots level championing the cause for change. We are leery of politicians who promise reform, but that reform never comes. And we are leery of people who put forward quick solutions when those solutions are not likely to get at the issues embedded in the system. Now, nursing believes, along with many others, uh, that there must be universal coverage, et cetera. But nursing is unique in some of what it is calling for in its plan. It is calling for, first of all, an increased use of what we call advanced practice prepared nurses, nurse midwives and nurse practitioners. If you look at statistics on infant mortality for many of the European countries, you know that they have achieved what they have because of their system of midwives, which makes prenatal care, good prenatal care, available to all citizens. I am certain it is no surprise to anybody sitting in this room to know that there are states across the United States that will not allow nurse midwives to provide services because they believe those services may be of questionable quality. I can tell you of a region in the state of Oregon where women on Medicaid have to go without prenatal care, and the nurse midwife in that community who wants to deliver that care is precluded from being able to do so because of the regulatory mechanisms surrounding practice. Now, nursing is unique in its call for this set of health care providers to be made the mainstay of primary health care for citizens here in the United States. It is also unique in its call for taking health care to where people are rather than making people go to where health care providers are. I think everybody in this room should be concerned about the fact that approximately 70% of the children in our schools in Oregon get their health care from the school secretary. I'm not against school secretaries but they are not prepared to make the health care decisions about our children in, those, in the roles that they are performing. We have taken health care away from where people are. Less health care is available in industrial sites. Less health care is available in community sites. And nursing is unique in its call to take health care and put it where people are and make it accessible. We know from all kinds of data that working women will not leave work to get their own health care. They put the economic needs of their family first and foremost. The only way that group will get health care is if we bring it to where they are. And nursing is unique in its plan in terms of saying that has to occur and must occur if we are to bring about some of these changes. Now, nursing is also somewhat unique 
in its emphasis on a health care system rather than an illness care system. And uh, this example may or may not be meaningful to you, but I offer it to you as one which tries to suggest what we mean when we talk about holistic health care. And it's a, a research report in the Archives of Internal Medicine. And it was a study to look at practice patterns of different kinds of providers. And there were various internists, family practitioners, general practitioners, and nurse practitioners in the study. And they confronted each of these people by a telephone survey with a little vignette. Patient comes to you, it's got pain in their belly, uh, and they didn't call it a belly, but got pain and certain symptoms, and uh, what would you do? Two-thirds of the physicians ordered drugs without asking any other question. <laughs> Write the prescription, give the pill, take away the symptoms. Eighty percent of the nurses insisted on additional information about nutrition, stress patterns, alcohol consumption, smoking history, etc., and ended up prescribing changes in lifestyle as a way to eliminate the symptoms and the problems. Now that's what we mean by a holistic approach to health care. It doesn't look at you in terms of disease cells. It looks at you as a human being, and it brings to bear concerns about what you eat, how you live, what you drink, what your habits are, as a way to try to understand how best to facilitate your being able to improve your health status. Now just one more point, and then I think it is time for me to end and open it up for questions. One more point that I would like to make. Uh, all, many of you have heard about the placebo effect, and researchers always use it as a way to try to test the effectiveness of the treatment that they're advocating. A physician named Roger Bulger, who was the president the University of Texas uh, in Houston, but is now the executive director of the Association of Academic Health Centers, published an article recently giving us an updated version on the placebo effect. And he starts the article with these quotes. The first is attributed to Oliver Wendell Holmes, who said in effect that if all the medicines were in the world were thrown into the sea, it would on balance be good for people and bad for fish. The second is attributed to a French physician who said, it is important to use new treatments as often as possible before they become ineffective. <laughs> and the third quote from Harvard's famous biochemist, L.J. Henderson, says, somewhere between 1910 and 1912 in this country, a random patient with a random disease consulted a doctor chosen at random and had for the first time in the history of mankind a better than 50-50 chance of profiting from the encounter. <laughs> now Roger Bulger goes on in his article to say that despite all of the money that we are putting into high technology, the results of that technology are no better than what we get with less technology. And in fact, if we just encourage people in terms of healthy lifestyles, many of them will cure themselves and don't need interventions. According to the data that Roger Bulger has pulled together over decades of research, your chances of improving from a placebo are just as good as improving from a high piece of technology. Now what is he saying? It's not throw out all the technology. What he's saying is that in healthcare, we must factor in the human element. We are complex entities, and what makes one of you heal is not necessarily what will make another heal. And Roger Bulger calls for a return to the art of healthcare, where we look at people as individuals who can actually manufacture the ability to heal within themselves if we only allow them the opportunity to do that. Now in conclusion, again, what am I trying to really say to all of you? 
I'm trying to say that I believe our health care system is really bad. And it doesn't mean the people in it aren't trying. I mean, I'm part of the system. I'm trying. But it is a system that nobody likes any longer. I can't tell you how many physicians say to me, I no longer like practicing medicine. Nurses say, I don't like practicing nursing. The system, somehow or other, has taken a hold, and nobody likes it, and it is bad. I'm trying to say we can't let ourselves be bought off with cheap remedies and banned aids as we try to deal with it. Secondly, I'm trying to say that when we create a new system, we need to create a system that allows us to benefit from the experiences of people across the world who know the benefit of primary health care, who know the benefit of prevention, who know the benefit of disease promotion, excuse me, disease prevention, and who truly know how to get people to be able to interact to bring those kinds of changes in health status about. And I'm also saying that no matter what we do as a country, let us realize that just more and more high technology is not going to do much for your health, my health, or the health of children. What will make the difference is restoring the art of health care that places the initial burden on the individual for developing healthy lifestyle and healthy patterns. Thank you. Dr. Lindemann, thank you for those very sobering remarks. I'm sure they'll generate a lot of questions. The first one will be asked by Mary McWilliams, followed by a question from the floor from Sandy Marin, and then we'll open it up to questions from the audience. Well, Dr. Lindemann, you've really done an excellent job of chronicling the problems of the health care system, uh, and I think offering a promising uh, paradigm for us. And what I would like to ask, um, particularly given I'm working on the financing side of health care and not for all the Sisters of Providence, just to correct that title. Um, uh, I'm interested in how you would change the financing of health care so that we'd have greater emphasis on prevention and primary care delivered through nurses. In terms of who should pay for it? H how health care should be financed, how you can use the payment for health care and the financing system. A lot of debate about single payer, about um, managed care systems, uh, et cetera, et cetera. What different tools in the financing alternative health care would result, in bottom line, in the kind of emphasis on prevention that you described? Again, I, you know, I, I don't, um, if I had a solution, you obviously understand I wouldn't be here. I'd be someplace else <laughs> right now. <laughs> I tell you that organized nursing uh, supports what's called a, a, a pay or play system with putting the primary responsibility still on business to help support the healthcare system, and by doing so uh, through various mechanisms, either contributing to a high risk pool of money or uh, continuing to uh, pay uh, healthcare costs. Of course, business objects to that because they see this continuing escalation of healthcare costs and say, well, we can't possibly afford to do that. I think whenever you talk about the financing, you have to talk about the financing of a remodeled system. Otherwise, nobody is going to be able to pay for it. I mean, the estimate by the year 2000 is we'll spend over a trillion dollars for health care per year if things keep up the way they currently are. So we have to change the system, and then we have to go back to the issues about how to pay for it. I can also say to you that personally, I have been uh, very impressed with the national effort to look at um, uh, national financing of health care and uh, with the increased uh, reduction of overhead costs, paperwork, I do not think we can continue with the current system where it drives everybody crazy in terms of how to fill out the right forms to get the right reimbursement from the right person. That's taking $170 billion a year out of our health care system. And somehow or other, we either have, a, have to have a simplified financing by business 
um, or through the federal government. I think it's a policy question that you and I will debate in terms of is health care a right of citizenship or is it a right of employment? And when it's stated that way, I come down saying it ought to be a right of citizenship, just like education. Sandy Marin, Human Services Standing Committee. You talked about uh, nurses campaigning for better health and trying to make some changes in health care reform and working with the consumers on a grassroots involvement. And the first step, obviously, is getting the information out, as in this forum. How else would you suggest that the people in this room work towards health care reform? What steps can they take to make this ha the, a new paradigm happen? But I, again, I do believe that as citizens of this country, we need to feel obligated to bring about improvements in the social situation in this country. So I think, you know, I begin with the belief that when you die, the world ought to be better because you lived, not worse because you lived. And so there's that obligation, that commitment to try to do things to bring about improvement. I also believe with Jerry Frank, uh, who wrote a, an article in a, from the Friday Oregonian always, but he wrote an article a few weeks back called The Importance of One. And so often we want to say, well, I'm only one person, what can I do? But we fail to realize that we have the Vietnam Memorial in Washington, D.C. because of one poor person, a veteran from Vietnam who believed in that. So I think, Sandy, part of it is developing a personal vision about health care and what it could be and being willing to take on the responsibility to talk with others and do things about it. But I think we all are part of groups. You know, I went to my church group a couple months back and I said, we give money to missions overseas. Why don't we put money into a health care system operated in our church and make health care available to everybody who comes to this church? And my church is very positive about that idea. But there are all kinds of ways that we can work with groups. But I think it begins with saying, it's my health, it's my life, it's the life of people I love, and I'm going to do something about it. But it, you know, it's just rolling up our sleeves and getting out and trying to do it, and talking with people. My name is Walt Roberts, City Club member. Dr. Lindemann, I, my question is of the uh, tone that the previous question is. And I'd like to look uh, and talk to you or address you about change, the process of change, and what it takes. Um, you talk about systems, and there's a whole systems perspective, a theory of science and a school of intellectuals who look at systems and systems design we have systems and systems of systems. There's the education system. You talked about getting to the youngest people as early as possible and, and helping them to come to, to know that taking care of themselves is really the first step in all this. So my question is, is uh, not so much what can we do here, I think you addressed that, uh, but what, what is the point of leverage in the process of change, altering a whole paradigm? From your perspective, is it uh, the political system? Is it the education system? Is it uh, what? And, and how much pain are we going to have to endure uh, socially, culturally, before, before something will uh, really break open about this? Let me uh, attempt to answer the, the question. And uh, I may go off on some tangent, in which case bring me back. But I think, again, uh, part of the change begins with being clear on what we think the better system is. I have ideas, you have ideas, others have ideas, but, and we won't know all the answers, but at least we have to be pretty clear on what we want. Do we really want access to prenatal care for every pregnant woman in this country? Those, those kinds of things. Uh, where do we stand in terms of uh, levels of health care? Do we want the same benefits for everybody or 
differences based on income or so on. I think we have to come to grips with some of those kinds of issues as we think about the paradigm that we want to have. I'm a believer in experimentation before going ahead and making everything change. And here in the state of Oregon, and again, I know that the Oregon Nurses Association is attempting to do some of this, uh, we need to have more demonstrations of what a different system could look like. Now, I've shared some of my concern about children in schools, and I think, again, you and I need to be concerned with the increasing suicide rate, the increased depression, the increased violence that is characterizing health for our, our children. But, and I have an idea about a demonstration of a better system for health care for kids and their families. That needs to get up and running so that you can see it, so Ralph can evaluate it, uh, you know, and we can look at whether this is better or that's better or something else. But it, too often, we uh, let rhetoric tell us what to do without testing it out, seeing if we have better ideas. I do think, again, you know, if, uh, I think we need to do things in terms of um, the regulatory laws, practices surrounding health care providers. I think there's an area there that needs to be reformed. Certainly reimbursement needs to be uh, modified. I think it's a crime that you can get paid if you give somebody an injection, but if you counsel them about their nutrition, you can hardly get any reimbursement for it. It's a system that, again, emphasizes illness and technology rather than other things. I think we must work to bring about those changes, but at the same time, then get on with these other demonstration projects, looking at alternate systems. And I don't think we have to reinvent the wheel. I really do believe that there, you know, we've been in the business of health care for hundreds of years, and there's a lot to learn from other people. Uh, let me say one more thing. And I don't want, you know, so often when we talk about health care reform, people end up saying, oh, that's just a fight between the doctors and the nurses. Or it's a fight between the hospital administrators and the doctors. And we write it off with ne negative stereotypes, kind of negative advertising like happens in political campaigns. And what that does is it takes us away from the real issue, and we end up focusing on something else and saying, well, let them figure it out. We can't do that with the healthcare system. It isn't a fight between doctors and nurses. It isn't a fight between hospital administrators and insurers. It is our healthcare system. And the data show us just how bad it is. It is. I'm Ray Polani, a City Club member. Um, Dr. Lindemann, uh, I think you mentioned a change in paradigm. And perhaps the change ought to be that there is a premium on being uh, well rather than being sick. That the, uh, the providers make money out of people being healthy rather than out of people being sick. That's probably the basis of it. I happen to think that there is something close to this in existence. 35 years ago, my wife and I joined the Kaiser Foundation. And we did it because we read an article in those days which said, if you join here, the interest of this group is going to have you, is going to, for you to be well rather than be sick. They're going to make money when you pay the premiums and don't come near the facility. They're going to lose money when you pay the premiums and need care. Uh, it's an oversimplification, but I think that's probably the crux of it. Somehow or other, uh, maybe a universal insurance system where there is a rebate uh, based on the, on the health of the people rather than on the sickness of the people. So what do you think? I think the concept underlying uh, health maintenance organizations, whether they be Kaiser or others, certainly is, again, an idea that most of us 
subscribe to and think is a good approach and that one ought to uh, put their energies and efforts into keep, keep people being healthy rather than just treating the illness. Unfortunately, uh, Kaiser is also part of the larger system as are other health maintenance organizations and any other group that tries to do the same thing. So you end up still with a system that has these very high costs built into it uh, for treating the illness part. So I, again, it would seem to me that something like that could only work, again, if we changed the entire system and moved into, if you will, that kind of, of a paradigm. But I, you know, again, I have heard of all kinds of thoughts, such as paying people if they were healthy, um, and I, there's something about that that distresses me, and you know, might keep people who need health care away from getting health care. Um, but again, I think we need to, to look at every opportunity for a new paradigm that emphasizes health, health promotion, disease prevention. Speaking, a Ted K, City Club member, speaking of new paradigms, Oregon's recent innovative proposal to ration health care has run into a challenge at the federal level. Would you comment on your opinion of its merits and of its chances? I'll be, I'll be glad to comment on my perception of its merits, and I think I can tell you what I think about its chances, but I don't know that that they would fall under the category of being wise. They may just be emotional reactions. But uh, I had the uh, privilege, actually, of talking with John Kitzhaber as he attempted to design that piece of legislation. And I was extremely impressed with the intent of what he wanted to do. The intent of what he wanted to do did get compromised as he had to go through the political process of creating legislation and moving it ahead. And some of the excitement in terms of health promotion uh, that was there initially is still there, but as the categories uh, uh, to create the basic health care system were created, again, as you uh, know, they ended up having to use disease treatment matches, which moved away a little bit from the strong emphasis on a paradigm that emphasizes basic health care in the sense of primary health care uh, with the greater emphasis on disease uh, prevention, et cetera, that I would hope would be there. Uh, I am also concerned that although this is not a part of the legislation per se, that if we do not open up access and allow other providers the opportunity to get people into the system that we will still not see universal access in the state of Oregon even though that is an intent of the legislation. I support that, but I support it as a beginning, not an ending and not an answer. But we must begin somewhere and to me that is certainly a better beginning than other plans that I have seen in other states. So I have, have and remain a supporter of that. What are its chances? Um, again, I would say if you have a president uh, of the country who believes the health care system is just fine, the likelihood of an experimental plan to improve the system being approved may be a long shot, um, but the pressure is there to allow experimentation. Other states uh, have simply avoided the issue of designing a system that had to get a waiver or approval or so on uh, and have gone ahead with their, their efforts. I certainly hope that Oregon continues to pull together the data, challenge the decision of the administration, and try to push that plan through. So, uh, but I, don't, I have no idea whether it will fly or not. I, you know, I suspect that if all three million Oregonians started really creating a fuss, we may be heard, but part of it, again, may be that we have allowed too few people to carry the weight for all of us in the fight for reform. Uh, Dr. L Dr. Lindemann, uh, Dave Borgendale, City Club member. Um, you alluded to people uh, blaming the, the cost problem on, on, uh, on the uh, 
greater proportion of, of the aged in our society. And uh, I have looked at a study, and I don't remember who did it, and I don't remember the exact statistics, but uh, that, that said that at least 25% of lifetime costs of deliver, delivering of health care, I think the number was much larger than that, but <laughs> to be safe, I think it's 25% are spent in the last year of life. Um, with the heroic measures that happen uh, over that period of time and all of the high-tech stuff that you alluded to. Uh, could you give us some ideas on how you would deal with that aspect of the cost problem and how maybe society ought to start making sensible decisions about that? Sure. Again, the way I kind of talk about that uh, is in terms of what's called in the literature the technological imperative, which simply says we can, therefore we must. And many of the people in healthcare today operate from that perspective. If we have the ability to do it, we must do it for everybody in every instance. And because we, healthcare providers, bring that attitude to patient care, the patient ends up believing. If they can, therefore I must let them. Now, I, again, I could give you examples uh, from my own family where I, when my mother was dying, terrible things were done to her under the rubric of, but it might make a difference. We all knew it would never make a difference, but she had a terrible death. And she had a terrible death because of what healthcare providers did to her as she was dying. And we hear that over and over again, where the individual does not want it, but either they no longer can say that or their family's request cannot be honored from some um, perspe pers legal perspective or what have you. I think we must work with people uh, to enable them to make clear decisions about what they want to happen to them under certain circumstances and allow the doctor-patient relationship and the use of technology to be guided by that. I don't think we've done enough in terms of educating people, working with people, for how they want to be cared for in, in uh, that period of their life. And I also think we must have better data on the effectiveness of medical technology. You know, somebody wants to get a new heart and they have a vision of what their life's gonna be like after they get that new heart, perhaps only to find that that was a myth in terms of their expectations. We don't do very well in terms of saying to people, Yes, we could do this, but this is perhaps what your life will be like even with this use of this high technology and so on. I think we have to free up healthcare providers to feel comfortable engaging with individuals and allowing free choice, informed choice, educated choice, but choice in making those decisions. Well, Dr. Lindemann, in order to change a paradigm, I think you said that you have to be willing to look at things differently, and I think that's what you've helped us do today, hopefully, is to look at the system a little differently. And so we thank you very much for being with us today.